My brothers in Alpha, this is Brother Denny Ann Johnson, your Senior Director of Brotherhood Engagement and Global Outreach at your corporate headquarters of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. As you can see, I'm coming to you live from the 93rd Southern Regional Convention here in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was something very special. We had our uh, regional fraternal luncheon here at the regional convention, which featured Brother Dr. William Barber, renowned uh, preacher and civil rights leader and activist who brought a mighty, mighty word to the brotherhood. And in case you missed it, we want to share a snippet for you for, so you can capture the moment that was shared by Brother Dr. Barber. Please enjoy. My father was on the inauguration line at St. Augustine College. <laughs> President Ward and I were talking about that. 1947. My father started school at Elizabeth City State University and Dr. Trigg was the president at Elizabeth City State. It was a two-year school. They recruited my father for the Navy. When my father showed up in Norfolk, he had been recruited, he was drafted to teach recruits because he had two years of college education. A white racist captain said, oh, you think you one of them up at the high yellow so-and-so, and snatched him out of the line and said, what you gonna do is empty my pot and tote my pee. Dr. Trigg, in 1940s, used his power, called up a Southern senator who was not a friend of civil rights, made the case for my father, got him reinstated, and then reinstated to the proper things, and then brought him to St. Aug with him. And it was after that that my father then was on the inaugural line. That's what Alphas do. I told this young brother that I'm at Yale and I want to offer something to the region in the South. When they asked me to come to Yale, the president asked me, what can we do for you? I said, nothing. I'm dangerous now. I don't want nothing. I'm old, retired. I don't want nothing but try to do what's right. I said, it's not about me. I've had enough time for acting. I said, but what you can do is Yale block the development of the first HBCU in America. It was supposed to be in, 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 um, in um, where Yale is in New Haven. The founder of Yale was a racist. The divinity school at Yale was pro-slavery. I said to him, in light of that, 200 years later, what Yale ought to do is reparations. And one way you should do it is create a fund. Uh, and we have a fund that gives millions of dollars to students that does two things. Any student in Connecticut that wants to go to an HBCU, especially in the South, Yale will pay for it. And then Yale will pay for them to come back to Yale free for graduate school. And any black student from an HBCU in the South that wants to go to Yale for graduate school where Higginbotham and other folk went, they can get a free ride, they got to pay. So today, I can't get them in if they don't do the work, but if they do the work, I want to offer to the South region to be the conduit for undergraduate students that want to go to Yale to get a free ride. It ain't about what I get no more. If at 61 you don't have enough to be satisfied, yeah, the rest of your life has to be about what you do for others. So, bro, you told me you want to go to Yale? We're going to work on that. Leah Law School. I uh, don't want to interrupt your chicken. But I'm not a bumper sticker speaker. I don't do quick, cutie, um, plate carpet, you know, just phraseology. 
and get folk fired up and they don't know what the hell they fired up about. They just like the rhymes and stuff. I, I just don't do that. So if other folk do it, that's their thing. Uh, and y'all can see I'm not as large as I once was, but I'm a jumbo jet. I'm not no little plane. I don't take off that just like that. I have to taxi for a while. And I got a big head, so I got to ruminate. I still got to roll around in it. So I didn't come here today to do a quickie. I came here today to speak to brothers as men and to take you deeply seriously. We live in a time when we must have what one attorney called legal realism and realize that we have people, politicians, and forces in this country that do not see politics as an avenue or as the mechanics for fulfilling the preamble of the Constitution, establish justice, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, ensure domestic tranquility. They do not see politics as an avenue for fulfilling the promises of the 14th Amendment, ensuring equal protection under the law for all persons, or the 15th Amendment, no, no state or gov government can deny or bridge the right to vote. They see politics as something you use with bad intentions. Extreme forces that, that, that have bad reasons for wanting to be leaders. They take power just to take more power. Dr. King one time said that there are two elements of this. The extremist, racist, and the moderate who is more interested in, in, in order than justice. He said both were bad. Coretta Scott King, after her husband had been brutally shot with a deer rifle through the neck, June of that same year spoke at the Lincoln Memorial and said when somebody asked her about violence, she said, violence is not just somebody shooting your husband with a gun. Violence is denying education. Violence is denying housing. Violence is denying wages. Violence is denying people's culture. But violence is also having an apathetic attitude and refusing to challenge the other forms of violence. Bad people with bad intentions, like McConnell. You know, they're getting ready to try to make him a saint. That's what they do when folk get ready to step down or die. It's a, it's a bad thing, because somebody ought at least tell the truth at your, at your funeral or at your retirement. <laughs> They'll at least tell the truth at your retirement. If you ain't done shit, they'll have to say that. I mean, I, I'm talking to y'all as men now. Ain't no need to lie. If you've been mean, you've been mean. Right? Just tell the truth. You had a whole life to do better. Right? This man opposed bills for, for his own minors in his state. He wouldn't fix black, he took people's black loan benefits. He said the government ought to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And 40 million Americans being crushed by student loan debt, he blocked the bank for student emergency loan refinancing. He blocked Obama from his, he stole an appointment from Obama to the Supreme Court and from Biden. Stole it, just stole it, right in their face. Bad people with bad intentions. He united his party against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. All folk from Georgia in here. That's McConnell's work. McConnell got all the Republicans and two Democrats, moderate Democrats, so-called, to join him in voting against the Voting Rights Act and the John Lewis bill so that a black woman named Kamala Harris would not have the opportunity to cast a deciding vote.
He used his power to block living wages, block universal health care. He acquitted Trump. Bad intentions. The night that Ruth, think about this, the night that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, this man called Trump and said, I will fill the vacancy in weeks. You got to nominate Amy Barnett, Barrett, and, and we're going to fill it, even though he had said that should never happen when there's a transition in power. Hmm. He vowed, he, he said this, the single most important thing we must achieve with our power is for President Obama to be a one-term president and to block everything he tries to do. Do not be mistaken. We are in a season where bad people want political power for bad intentions. It's not just him. Clarence Thomas fights all the programs he used to get into Yale, to get a white wife. <clears throat> I'm bishop today, I ain't playing. He refused to recuse himself. Cases when he's got donations from people that are interested, conflict, when his wife was calling around on the insurrection. Thomas led the way for the Voting Rights Act to be gutted. Do you realize, brothers, my brothers from Alabama, we're sitting here today and we've got less voting rights than we had August 6, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was first passed. Thomas. And then he turned around and allowed corporations to be able to put, to be, to be seen as people. Therefore, they can put all the money they want in a campaign. Bad people with bad intentions. When Thomas argued against affirmative action, he, his example was Jim Crow laws. Yeah, if y'all read that, you, you brothers, now you know Alphas read, y'all need to read that, this, that, that majority opinion. He took the justifications for segregation laws and twisted them into a legal argument against affirmative action. Against making sure that students like this brother would get a shot, not because he didn't, doesn't have the grades, because it's never been about us having the grades. It's about us having the opportunity. Not just them. We got a person in this state running for governor. He said he ain't black. <laughs> he goes around celebrating Hitler. And is leading the Republican ticket. He's homophobic. He's against union rights, against living wages, against voting rights. We live in a time, it is, if you think this is about one man whose name starts with a T and has his own, you are sadly mistaken. This is about an era, the crisis of civilization, where people want power just to take more power, and they use power with bad intention, and if you don't use your power to stop them, And for us as Alphas, it is our legacy. And if we don't do it, then take the damn shield off. Take it off! You lied when you pledged. It was in the 1920s and 30s, in the middle of the Depression, when a president had played birth of the nation in the Oval Office that celebrated the Ku Klux Klan. It was in that environment that Alpha Phi Alpha said, we need a program. A voteless people is a hopeless people. And Brother Logan said, 
even though they, the odds are against us, we must still fight. Listen to what he said at the convention. To all alpha men, I propose the following pledge. I pledge myself to become a registered voter as soon as I'm eligible to vote in all elections that are open. I pledge to work untiringly until Negroes have helped to break down the fastest one-party system of the South, especially by the Supreme Court when it authorized the exclusion of Negroes from the Democratic Party. I pledge to register and move everybody I can to the polls, and as I know that vote was unanimous and has not been rescinded since the 1930s. It is the order of our, social, of our fraternity. And, I, and before then, in 1905, Brother W.B. Du Bois, founder of the Niagara Movement that became the NAACP, he said, we claim for ourselves every right that belongs to a free-born American political, civil, and social and until we get those rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America about the crisis she is in and the shameful deeds toward us. They do not expect that the free right to vote, to enjoy civic rights, and to be educated will come in a moment. No, we do not expect to see the bias and prejudice of years disappear at the blast of a trumpet. But we are absolutely certain that the way for people to gain their reasonable rights is not by voluntarily giving them up. That people must fight. That people must gain respect. That people must resist the belittling and the ridiculing. And the Negro must insist continually in seasons and out of season that voting is necessary to modern man, that color discrimination is barbarism, and that the black boy needs an education as well as the white boy, and that the power of the ballot we needed in sheer defense lest we fall into a second slavery. In other words, Du Bois said, if you ain't securing the vote and pushing the vote, stop calling yourself a man. Our national program of voteless people is a hopeless people is what all the other fights came from. Us. The Voting Rights Act fight. Who led Selma? Us. Dr. Rayford Whittington Logan, 15th General President, he organized uh, um, the Educational Adjustment Movement. General Convention, New Orleans, December 1937. It was Alpha that united 27 national organizations in the 30s. We did that. But living on your laurels ain't worth a damn. And telling pledges what happened 50 years ago rather than talking about what we're doing today. And at that time, because of the obstacles to voting, only 3% of eligible African Americans in the South were even registered. But we kept the fight alive and said we're going to do best, we're going to mobilize that 3% and get 4%. But what we're not going to do, and I know I'm, I said we men today, we're not going to let people piss on us and tell us it's raining. So here are three things. Not voting our strength, and by our strength, I don't just mean alpha men. I mean the strength of our community, the strength of our collective possibility in organizing. Number one, allows, write this down or memorize it, bad people to control our government. We are an accessory to the crime of Donald Trump. You say, what? Yep. Look at your brother and say, if you didn't work as hard as you could, 
You're an accessory. Now there's some grace in here. There's some grace in here. We can get it right. Now you said, Brother, that's hard. Well, let me listen to what Dr. King said during the Selma to Montgomery movement. When James Reeb, a white minister, was shot in the stomach, beaten and killed, Dr. King said, James Reeb, he, he, he laid out how bad people had caused this. But listen who he lists as the bad people. James Reed was murdered by the indifference of every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. He was murdered by the irrelevancy of the church that will stand amidst social evils and serve as a tail light rather than a headlight as an echo rather than a voice. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician who has moved down the path of demagoguery, who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the small meat of racism. He was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff and law enforcement agency. He was murdered by every black civic organization that does not step up. He was murdered by the timidity of the federal government that will spend millions of dollars a day to keep troops in South Vietnam but can't protect the lives of his own citizens right here. He was even murdered by the cowardice of every Negro who tacitly accepts the evil system of segregation and stands on the sidelines with their money in the midst of a mighty struggle for justice. That's why they don't play that during the Martin Luther King holiday. And all you hear is the, the hoop, I have a dream, which wasn't even the speech. The speech was, Norma said, never again. James Carvey last night on CNN reminded us that we're in a mess, not because of one man, but because bad people, many got into office because people didn't vote their strength, and they used their power starting in 2000 to steal an election, then after they stole the election, they put Citizen United in place so the corporations could take over the election with money. And then they did Holder versus Shelby in Alabama to gut the Voting Rights Act. It's not one man. It's a system. This is what it is. When you get sick and go, the ain't the sickness. That's the symptom. Trump is the <laughs> Second thing. Can I talk to us as men? When we don't vote our strength and organize, we can be hopeless against bad policies. Not only bad people get it, but we hope because people with bad, unjust intent in office create bad policy. Policy doesn't just happen. It's planned. Tomorrow, in 33 states in D.C., we're launching a 42-week campaign to mass poor people's low-wage workers more march on state assemblies and to the poll. We're launching, we're not having a march a day, it's a launch to do 42 weeks to mobilize 15 million poor and low wage infrequent voters because of the state of policy in this nation. We're not doing it for a personality, because personality will benefit, but you can't move people to vote over personality. You gotta move them to vote until they understand they're voting for their lives. Alabama? We're mobilizing because in Alabama, <clears throat> between 2018 and 2020, there's 1.9 million poor and low-income people in Alabama. Poor and low-wealth people make up 39% of the population in Alabama. In Alabama, you have to make $22 hours and $22 an hour, two, two adults, two children, and a family, and the current minimum wage is $7.25, has not been raised since 2009. And if you work in the restaurant industry, your minimum wage is $2.13 plus tips. So in Alabama, you gotta work 90 hours a week just to afford a basic one bedroom apartment. In Alabama, 
896,000 people, 40% of the workforce earn less than $15 an hour in Alabama. And that, and that, means, and that includes uh, 34% of Asians and Native workers, 58% of black workers, uh, six, excuse me, 58% of Native workers, 61% of black workers, and 60% and, and, and of Hispanic workers, and 32% of white workers, and 50% of working women, and 64% of working women of color in Alabama make less than a living wage. In Alabama, in Alabama, over 400,000 people were without insurance during the worst days of the pandemic. In Alabama, 1.8 million workers, 80% of the workforce doesn't have paid leave. In Alabama, your state legislature has filed 20 voter restriction bills since 2020. In Alabama, there were 1.9 million poor and low income eligible voters. 1.3 million white, 1.7 million Latino, 6 million of Asian, 569 black voters, and the margin of victory wasn't but 500,000 votes, and 900,000 of them didn't vote. In Florida, Florida here? In Florida, there are 9,539,000 poor and low income people in your state. 44% of your state is poor and low wage. In Florida, you, know, you got to make $25 an hour to have basic needs met. Your current minimum wage is $11 an hour, and the governor and others blocked it from being raised, even though you voted for it at the poll. you got to work 111 hours a week in Florida just to possibly rent a, a modest two-bedroom apartment. There are 4 million 400,000 people or 41% of the workforce in Florida that makes less than $15 an hour. 36% of Asians and Native, 57% of all black workers, 51% of Hispanic workers, 32% of white workers, 49% of working women, 59% of women of color. The majority of those making less than a living wage are white, but the highest percentage of those is black in Florida. During the worst days of the pandemic, 2.5 million people were uninsured. In Florida, 8.4 million workers, 78% don't have paid family leave. In Florida, they have pushed nine voter restricted bills since 2020. In Florida, there are 7,617,000 poor and low income eligible voters. But in Florida, that, that's, that's 4 million white, 1 million Latino, 100,000 Asians, 1.1 million black, 20,000 indigenous. 43% of the electorate. The margin of victory in Florida was 371,000 votes. 2.8 million didn't vote. One million black folk didn't vote, even though the margin of victory is only 300,000. In Georgia, there are 4.4 million poor and low income, low, low wage people. 42% of Georgians are poor and low income. So get, get away from thinking it's just somebody living on the street or just somebody in the inner city. It's not, this is a different analysis. In Georgia, you gotta make $23 an hour, family of two. Minimum wage is $7.25, you have to work 118 hours a week. There are 1.8 million people, or 36% of the workforce, that makes less than $15 an hour. 1 million, uh, 1.6 million adults, 26% uh, of Asians, 47% of black, 54% of Hispanic, 27% of white workers, 44% of working women, 54% of working women of color. In Georgia, during the worst days of the pandemic, 1.3 million people were uninsured. 4.1 million workers, or 78% of the workforce in the state, do not have access to paid leave. In Georgia, there have been 42 voter restriction bills introduced since 2020. 42. In Georgia, there were 2.4 million poor and low wage eligible voters, including 1.3 million white, 84,000 Latino, 32,000 Asian, and 860,000 black voters. One million didn't vote, and the margin of victory was 11,000 votes. In Mississippi, there are 1.3 million poor, low-income people. You need $21 an hour, family four, 
minimum wage 725, 500,000 people in Mississippi, 45% of the workforce make less than $15 an hour. During the most intense days of the pandemic, 339 people, 39,000 people were not insured because Mississippi did not expand Medicaid. One million workers, 80% of the workforce do not have paid access to, to pay, paid family leave. Mississippi has introduced 36 voter restriction bills. In Mississippi, there are one million poor and low-income voters, 636,000 white, 3,000 Latino, 1 million, 1,000 Asian, 300,000 black voters. 43% of the electorate, 461,000 didn't vote, and the margin of victory was only 200,000 votes. In South Carolina, y'all here? In South Carolina, there are two million South Carolinians that are poor and low income, 38% of the population. 38% of the population. And when you look at the numbers, the numbers tell us in that, in that state that somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, of that, that if just about 20% of, of the voters that did not vote were to vote, they could fundamentally shift the electorate. In North Carolina, nearly 40% of the electorate is poor and or low wealth. Nearly 40% of the workforce makes less than $15 an hour. In the last election, the marginal victory was 160,000 votes. A million folk did not vote who were poor and low wage in this state. And over a half million black folk. In addition to that, brothers, 75% of all Americans between 20 and 75 years of age will be among the poor or near poverty for at least one year of their life. Bad people make bad policy. All that I'm just talking about, that's policy. Somebody's doing that. It's not accidental. University of California, Riverside, paper was done April 17th. The Journal of American Medical Association said that in 2019, before COVID, 183,000 people died in the United States from poverty. poverty. Just poverty and low wages, killing people. Now, poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in America. Long-term poverty claims 295,000 lives a year, over 800 people a day. It would take you 600 years going to a funeral every day of the week to go to the funerals of the number of people that die from poverty in one year. That's political genocide. The analysis found out that only heart disease, cancer, and smoker, smoking had a greater number of deaths, and most of those things, a lot of those are caused by the ravages of poverty. Obesity, diabetes, drug overdoses, suicides, firearms, and homicide are less lethal than poverty. But if the homicide rate goes up 1%, it's national news, it's presidential, it's in the White House. But when 800 people die from poverty, you don't hear anything about it. Poverty kills more people than dementia, accidents, strokes, Alzheimer's, and diabetes. And it's all abolishable. About seven bills that 7% of Americans agree with could abolish poverty and low wages. When we don't vote, we risk political hopelessness because it allows bad people with unjust bad intent to produce bad policies that murder people. But the murder is called political violence. That was a term that came up by an 18th century sociologist in England that's now making its way back in the academy. We've got to talk about policy murder and policy violence. And did you know, brothers and sisters, that policy violence, not making sure that people have a living wage, not making sure that people have health care, is not just bad policy, it's sin. I said to preachers all the time, if you in the pulpit 
worrying about your church and pastor's anniversary, but you ain't in the street fighting for your folk to have health care, you ain't engaged in pastoral malpractice. <laughs> Proverbs 22 says, do not abuse the poor because they are poor. Isaiah 10 says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children pray. P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y. Jeremiah says, go down to the king's palace. Don't send a text message. Don't sign a petition. Go down to the king's palace and tell them, stop killing people. Matthew 25 says, you can do all you want to, get all the robe, do all the ties, do everything you want to, but at the end of the day, when I was hungry, and, 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 and he says, and, and, he, and he will say to the nation, not the individual, to the nation. And so if I allow the nation, then I become an accessory to the crime. Deuteronomy, and I'm so sick of folk that think they know the Bible and don't know it. Amen. You start talking about poverty and low wage, where well, I am Bob. You know, Jesus said that Paul will be with you always. That ain't what he said. Jesus was a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew. When Palestinian Jews uh, quoted a scripture of a text, they were quoting the whole pericope. They just didn't say the whole pericope because the culture would know that. The, the scripture he was quoting for actually begins like this. There need be no poor among you. If you do what I tell you to do, if you treat them right, if you don't steal from them, then it says the poor will be with you always, which is an indictment on society. It, that scripture was never meant for you to become halfway middle class, ain't two ass full from poverty, and then act like you can't see your brothers and sisters. I'm talking to men, right? Not only does not voting allow bad people, and bad policy, not voting is a bad use of power. When Dr. King stood on the steps of the Alabama State House, which I believe was his greatest speech, I think I Have a Dream was his greatest closing and vision, but his greatest speech was after that march, under the threat of being killed, he launches into this sermon. He talks about Truth um, uh, um, keeps marching on, but in the middle of it, he starts talking about the first reconstruction. He identifies the movement as being a part of the second reconstruction, and he starts talking about how voting rights was not even just about black people. And in that sermon speech, he says, the reason we have segregation, the reason we have so much division, is because the greatest fear of the racist aristocracy in this country is for the masses of Negroes and the masses of poor white people to join together and form a massive voting bloc, particularly in the South, that will fundamentally shift the economic architecture of the nation. He said, and it's possible, and folk know it's possible because it had already happened. That's what happened right after slavery. The fusion politic politicians were black and white. That's why in North Carolina you had the Wilmington riots. They wanted to destroy black and white folk working together for political power to pass good policy. It was a black minister and a white minister that got together and wrote the preamble to the North Carolina Constitution in 1868 which says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons, not men, all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor and the pursuit of happiness. It was black and white together fusion that guaranteed public education in, in the in Article One of the North Carolina Constitution. We don't even have a guarantee of, of education, public education, in the United States Constitution. But when black and white fusionists came together, poor whites and former slaves and freedmen and formed political power, they wrote the most transformative state constitution in the South. And the deconstructors said, we gotta shut it down. That's why they killed Martin. He was dead when he said that in 65. 
when he said my work from here is going to be to mobilize the masses of Negroes and the masses of poor whites into a voting bloc that fundamentally shifts the economic octave. I got my last threat last week to my house. I don't know what to talk about it, but since I'm talking to them brothers, they want me to know they know where I live. One third of the electorate in this country is poor. 85 million people. In 2020, 58 million of this group cast ballots. In the states, battleground states that they say are red and black, we really don't know what states are red and blue because we've never voted our power. Because in those states, 34 to 46 percent of the voters in battleground states are poor and low wealth. If just 20 percent of poor and low wealth, not 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 20 percent in battleground states were to mobilize around an agenda, they could change all political outcomes and mess up political calculation. But you got to have a movement vote, not a political vote, and it has to be about their lives and issues and not just about personality and party. In most of the battleground states, it would only take 5%. Let me give you a number. In Arizona, Georgia, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin, all had tight presidential races. In all but Texas, the margin of victory wasn't but 3%. But, the left, but, but poor and low wealth voters made up 34% of the electorate. Only in Texas was the margin of victory 5%. In, in Michigan, the margin of victory was 10,000 votes. One million poor and low wealth voters didn't vote. In Wisconsin, the, the margin of victory was 20,000. 1.1 million poor and low wealth voters did not vote. In Pennsylvania, the margin of victory was um, uh, 40,000. 1.5 million poor and low wage voters did not vote. In North Carolina, the margin of victory was, was 160,000. Um, Almost a million voters did not vote. If you add up those states, the total margin of victory is 270,000 votes. But in those same states, 4.1 million people did not vote, who are poor in no way. And the number one reason they don't vote, nobody talks to them. Politicians don't talk to them. We had 15 presidential debates, poverty, 43% of this country is in poverty and low wage. 51% of our children, 15 presidential debates, 135 million poor and low wage people in this country, and not one presidential debate asked the question, what's your plan for poverty and low wage? That's kill, that poverty is the fourth leading cause of death. 72% of Americans say they want a government-run health care system. 70% of Americans want to raise the minimum wage, including 62% of Republicans. But the corporate structure hold back and we participate when we don't vote our power it's close y'all God fixes it so and there's always a star in the midnight Amen. and if you flip these numbers over 135 million people in poverty but that also means over 100 million people who can vote and if the number one reason that they don't vote is, is the politicians don't talk to them, we should be talking to them. I went out to eastern Kentucky, Doc. They told me not to go out there. I went to Hazard County, Harlan County. They said, Bobby, them Hatfields and McCoy's going to kill you. I said, no. Nah. Nah. They said, that's Trump country. I said, no, it isn't. I said, the last time a, a Democrat president went out there was when Lyndon Baines Johnson announced the war on poverty. We went out there, 500 people showed up. I showed them how their state legislators who were getting them to vote against gay people and vote against voting rights were also voting against their health care, voting against their living wages, voting against their union. Five, four of those seven counties flipped in 218 and they sent an incumbent extremist home and put in a more progressive Democrat in Kentucky. So on June 15th, this is what I came to say, Brothers of Alpha. We're going, first of all, in order to reach 15 million people four times in 42 weeks, we need 200 people in every state, 33 states with district number, 
that will be trained in the technology of how to use in social media and the old form of walking the turf and knocking doors. You get 200 people in 34 states times working five, six days a week, touching 50 people a day over nine weeks, you touch 19 million people. 200 people a day in 200 people a state in 34 states in District of Columbia willing to use the technology to touch 50 people five or six days a week for nine weeks you touch 19 million people in less than nine weeks which means over 40 weeks you can touch at least four times and the average posters say you got to touch people at least two times to get them to vote if they haven't been voting you know alpha men are smart y'all know that right we do science <laughs> this is a science y'all and you don't do this with just a rah-rah speech you got to have some you got to get some chapters and some brothers that'll say we'll we'll find we'll do 200 we'll do 200 our state will do 200 and learn how to do it on june 15th we're calling for a mass moral march on washington dc on the congress by poor and low wage people religious leaders and advocates and to the polls this is the 60th anniversary of freedom summer this democracy will not survive with a political vote. We must have a movement vote that shakes up everything. We call the unions are in, and the only folk going to be able to do it are the unions, civic organizations, fraternal and sorority, uh, uh, poor people's campaign, and and, um, and 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 churches and religious bodies, progressive, coming together for a mass consciousness rally that that says we what 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 you mean. Everybody's voting such and such a way. What you mean people are apathetic? And launch a summer intensive, a summer intensive to, to touch 15 million poor and low wage voters in 35 states, especially in the battleground states where the margin of victory is within 2%, 5%, 10%, 18% of the number of people who didn't vote in the last election. Now we can come every year on King Day talking about we love Martin. But if we don't finish what he started, that ain't nothing but just playing king. We don't need no more celebrations, y'all. We need consecration. Reconsecration. Recommitment. If that was our, if that's our brother, God put it on his heart. You, the only way you honor prophets is when they fall, and they will fall. Prophets don't make it. They either get too tired, they get too sick, they die young, they, they get cynical, you just you don't make it. But when they fall, the only way you honor them is pick up the baton and finish the work. Now I also have to come here honestly. I come here because in 2022, and I'm almost through, when we had the first mass moral march on Washington and to the polls, we mobilized 2.7 million voters. Uh, we touched them in, in um, um, 13 states. And we have the data to show that if you pull the voters that we move to the polls out, people lose. And our brother, Ralph Warner, when I mean, he ran against Herschel, if you pull out the number of poor and low wealth voters that voted for him, the voters that we move were three times more than his margin of victory. Because the race was that close. You know. But I got hurt. Well, I really didn't get hurt. I just, it was sad to me that one day we was talking to a brother and he said to me, Doc, poor people's thing is alright, but our Alpha can't come on the stage and testify that he's poor or low wage. That'll embarrass the fraternity. To say he's poor and low wage and an Alpha man. I said, well, is he greater than Jesus? You mean tell me you, 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 you are Alpha and you can't be in the ghetto where Jesus was born? He was born in, you are Alpha, and most of y'all, most of us, me included, ain't that far away from being poor and low wage. 
And in this room, if any of us get six months, six, six months with no money, come on, y'all. But I said, if our fraternity can't be so aloof, if anybody ought to be bringing together all the fraternities and the sororities to meet in the street and move to the ballot box and finish the work of Brother Lofton and Mod. It should be Alpha right now, right here. <laughs> saving this democracy and more important, having a democracy worth saving. Meeting this crisis of civilization is a, and I declare unto you, I don't want to die. And it be said on my watch that I didn't try. And my brothers and sisters, if we come together on an agenda, we can unite churches and labor, maternal groups. And it's not even a hard lift. 20% is all we need. 20%. Not 30, not 40, 20%. God has fixed it. Oh, I feel something now. <clears throat> that the stones that the builders reject uh, now have the power to become the chief cornerstone of a brand new reality. God has fixed it. So there, there, there are some dry bones in the valley. But if you go down there and organize them and preach to them, they'll stand up. And when they stand up, God will put his spirit on them. And the Bible says they become a mighty army. God has fixed it. And God fixes it in every moment that there's always a way out. Oh, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And one of the things we can't do is let our foreparents do more with less. And we do less with more. They didn't have no cell phone. They didn't have Google. They didn't have TikTok. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have iPhone. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a bank account. They didn't have a college degree. They didn't have fraternity. They didn't have sorority. They didn't have computer. But they did more with less. With less they beat slavery. Somebody help me in here. With less they beat Jim Crow. With less they beat lynching. With less they beat the KKK. With less Harriet Tubman got 500 slaves out of slavery. And Frederick Douglass got himself and trained himself to be an international orator. They didn't have email. They, they didn't have texting. They didn't know what Twitter was. They had faith in God. They had moss on the north side of a tree. They had a star in the middle of the night. And they had a made up mind that I'm not going to let people just walk over me and take my freedom. Freedom! Oh, freedom! And before I be a slave, in any generation, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord. And whenever we stand up, faith is not what you believe about God, it's what you do because of what you believe about God. And when you do something, won't God show up? If you, you do your part, won't God show up? Faith without works is dead, but faith with works is powerful. We ought to stand until and, and, and have a testimony. We need a testimony. Some touch your neighbor and say, we need a testimony. Somebody, we need a real testimony that in our lifetime we did something. Now can I talk to y'all five minutes and I'm through. During COVID, I wrestled with death because my doctors told me that if I got COVID, I'd probably die before the, in fact, because I have immune deficiencies. And so I was real careful. But I kept watching people die. One family lost 25 members in a 30 mile radius. Another family, 12, but brother, sister, brother died. And one night it got on me bad. Like, why are you still alive? You're not better than them. You're not more special than them. Why are you still here? And, and over in the night, the Holy Ghost kind of like, he used to come to Howard Thurman mystically say, Baba, that's the wrong question every time. The question is not, not why you're he here, but what you going to do since you're still here. Because the truth of the matter is, you don't have but six minutes any day. Six minutes without breath. Most of us gone. Six minutes. So the question is, what are you going to do with your six minutes, your six hours, your six days, your six weeks, your six months, or your six years? And I stopped by to tell my brothers in Alpha, you're going to die. One day, it's going to all be over. And on that day, the question will be, while you lived, did you make a difference? Did you have a title? or a testimony? Did you have a title of destruction or a testimony of deliverance? One day, 
You're going to be gone. And I don't mean to be mean. I don't mean to be morbid. But you're going to be just dead. And if the funeral is at a black church, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. The choir going to sing real good that day. And the preacher going to preach like heaven because some of them Negroes he ain't going to see to the next funeral or church anniversary. And the cook going to cook that day. You know what they're going to serve. Chicken fried and barbecue, tater salad, warmed over green uh, beans, some yams, cornbread rolls, and some iced tea that'll give you diabetes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Huh? And they're going to tell him, don't preach too long, Reverend. And your family members that don't even come to see you while you alive, them Negroes going to get in the limousine that day. They ain't never had no ride in a limousine no other time. But on that day, they ain't driving the hoop there. They're going to try everything they can to get in the limousine. They're going to dress up, and afterwards, they're going to take you out of the church. Now, it doesn't matter how fancy you leave the church, you're going to leave. I don't care if a saxophone's in front of you. I don't care if the funeral director is high stepping. I don't care if they put on a top hat. Your hind parts going to leave that sanctuary. They're going to put you in a hearse. They're going to take you to the grave. You can call it what you want. They're going to throw you in a hole. And black folk don't stay around that hole long. They do not do long committal services. It's going to hurt. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Sorry you ain't here with us. And then they're going to start talking to each other. Man, it's not bad to speak like this. We should get together more often. And they're going to come back and have a banquet in your honor. Never had a banquet for you all the days of your life. But when you die, they're going to have a banquet in your honor. And on that day, all that's going to matter is do you have a testimony or a title where you are hurt for somebody, where you are mean somebody, where you are an unjust somebody, or where you are loving somebody, where you are just somebody, did you care for somebody? And you know the record is clear. Pharaoh had the title, but Moses had the testimony. I wish I had a witness. Goliath had the title, but David had the testimony. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had the title, but Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro had the testimony. Jericho had the title, but Joshua had the testimony. The jailer had the title, but Paul had the testimony. Slavery had the title, but Harriet Tubman and William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, they had the testimony. Jim Crow had the title, but Rosa Parks and Miss Boynton and Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin Luther King, they had the testimony. Apartheid had the title, but Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and the mothers of South Africa, they had the testimony. One Friday, Caesar had the title. Good God, I feel like preaching. One Friday, the Pharisees had the title. One Friday, the Sadducees had the title. They had it all night Friday. They had it all day Saturday. They had it all night Saturday. But early Sunday morning, God got up with his testimony and my testimony all power in his hand let's have hope and have a testimony until poverty is abolished let's have hope and have a testimony until everybody has a living wage let's have hope and have a testimony until we have full voting rights let's have hope and have a testimony until we have working rights and labor rights and health care for all and affordable housing and end gun violence and clean up the air and environmental justice and fully funded public education and just immigrant law until the hate and the lies and the homophobia and the anti-Semitism and the Islamophobia no longer have the latest loudest mic. Let's have hope and cast our votes until we take back the mic. Let's send the extremists home. Let's have hope until justice comes. Let's have hope. Hallelujah. Let's have hope and a testimony. I want a testimony. So when it's all over, when it's all over, yeah, Do you want a revolution? Do you want a revolution? Are you brothers of hope? Are you brothers that vote? Let's shake this nation up so that when the history book is written, it will say, in our generation, we had a testimony and did not surrender. Thank you for watching Sphinx TV. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe now for more content from the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha. 06